sir, today, as team leader of NABAR, it was spawned by RBI 30 years ago. I am proud and fortunate to be part of this inherited legacy, functionally and intellectually. It is also for the first time in 30 years history of NABAR that the head of our family, the Governor of Reserve Bank of India is amongst us. So, it is indeed a very proud moment for all of us in Nabad Parivar. And on behalf of every member of this Parivar, I thank you for this kind gesture. So it is in this backdrop that I invite you to kindly guide us. Governor sir, the floor is yours. Steve Bakshi, management and staff of Nabad former chairman, all the former employees of NABAR and all the well-wishers of NABAR assembled here. Thank you very much for including the Reserve Bank and me personally uh, in the 30 year anniversary celebrations of NABAR. This is a special occasion for NABAR of course, but it is also a special occasion for the Reserve Bank as uh, Sri Bakshi pointed out NABAR was incubated in the Reserve Bank before it rolled out as an independent financial institution in 1982. Over the last three decades, NABAR has grown and evolved from a unidimensional apex financial agency into a multidimensional institution for shaping and implementing the country's overall rural credit policy. NABAR has been a leader in promoting microfinance through the SAT Bank Linkage Program. By investing huge energies and manpower into this program and drawing upon its myriad roles, NABAR has reached 97 million households, making India's microfinance program the fastest growing, if not also the largest in the world. Completing three decades is an occasion for celebration, but it's also an occasion for introspection, to look back on the accomplishments and to look ahead to the challenges. But in recent years, there has been growing concern about the erosion of our food self-sufficiency at the margins. So a big challenge for sustaining food self-sufficiency is raising production, which given that arable agricultural land is actually limited, if not diminishing, has to come from increased productivity. A host of cash and non-cash inputs are necessary and among them, of course, the most important, at least one of the very important ones is agricultural credit. First, we all know that in the first two decades of independence, after independence, the main conduit for the flow of agricultural credit was the cooperative sector. So with the nationalization of commercial banks uh, starting the 1970s, commercial banks have got into uh, the business of agriculture credit. So this period, the 70s, also saw the introduction of the lead bank scheme, the priority, lectus, uh, priority sector lending scheme, two schemes that survive even to date. Then of course we move on to the economic reforms of the early 90s, the Narsimham Committee report which emphasized operational efficiency, at which time the Reserve Bank rolled back <coughs> almost the entire regulated interest rate regime. And the next two decades after the initiation of reforms in the 1990s saw several important initiatives in agriculture credit. And in 1989, as Mr. Bakshi just mentioned, the Kisan credit card was started, which has been a powerful mechanism for cutting down transaction costs both for the farmer and the banker. And today we saw a further advance in uh, uh, cutting down those transaction costs. In 2004, there was uh, the comprehensive credit policy uh, which emphasized that agriculture credit must grow by 30% every year. I have not done the calculation, but uh, that 740% that uh, Mr. Bakshi just mentioned perhaps uh, uh, reduces to this 30% per year. But there was also this target that there would be 100 farmers financed per every branch which is about 5 million farmers at the aggregate level. Finally, the last decade saw financial innovation in terms of uh, joint liability groups, aggregation models, and uh, the transformation 
of uh, PACS primary agriculture cooperative societies into multi-service centers to meet both credit and non-credit needs. Then the question is, what have commercial banks done? How have they performed with respect to cooperative institutions? In the first two decades uh, after 1980s, uh, 1970s commercial banks entered, but how does their performance compare with co cooperative banks after that? It is that beginning 1980s, cooperatives had a share of, of about 50%, commercial banks 40%, and RRBs and our Rural Electrification Corporation, the remaining 10%. But by 1984-85, you would see that the share of commercial banks had exceeded the share of cooperatives. The fourth trend is that there has been a sharp increase in the credit from commercial banks after 2000. I told you that 1990s there was a decline, but again commercial banks started picking up after 2000s. And by 2005-06, the three-year moving average of growth in agriculture credit from commercial banks was in double digits, hovering around 35%. Another question that we asked is, did commercial bank credit to agriculture, did that grow faster than aggregate commercial bank credit? Commercial bank credit has been growing, but was there any bias towards agriculture? Did credit to agriculture grow faster or slower than credit uh, from commercial banks to the rest of the sectors. Again, you would see that uh, the growth in commercial bank credit to agriculture, which is lower than the growth in aggregate bank credit during the 90s, picked up sharply in the first half of 2000s, and that again coincided with the growth in aggregate bank credit. Okay, then there was a downturn after that. What that shows is that uh, agriculture credit kept pace uh, with total agriculture credit from commercial banks. 